This conference will now be recorded. We are back once again to talk about building a bridge to edification through Yahshua Mashiach. We welcome in the presence of Abba for immortal life. Brother TJ, Dr. Troy. Oh, coming from Isaiah 118. Actually, I read it a little bit. Up, I'm going to start from 16, actually. 116. Let me pick that up quick. Because it's very interesting what the Most High tells us. It says, Wash and cleanse yourselves. Remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do right. Seek justice and correct the oppressor. Defend the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says Yah. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they will be like wool. If you are willing to be obedient, you will eat the best of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Yeah. Isaiah 1, 16 through 20. So, I still have not wrapped my head around when to start with this. Do we start with the proper priesthood? Because last week I was blowing your phone up. You already know it. Once yeah. I went back and reread, and I was like, hold up. How did I miss that? Jerusalem's yeah. been here for a long time. Uh huh. That's the beginning. I'm like, so what happened in Canaan that Melchizedek had to vacate the area, which we don't know, and then we end up where the Most High comes back with his own people to clean out the land, which is interesting if we're talking about part of today's lesson because we kind of see like a precursor of that with Jacob returning back mm -hmm. and Esau. So they return in the future, Israel returns back to the land again they don't have a peace offering. They just come with the most high. Mm -hmm. And the kings around them, they don't humble down or nothing like that. Some do. Most don't, though. They give them all yeah, types of hard times. Yeah, yeah. None, none of the kings do it. Only only one group of people that humbled out. Uh, but no no king that was ruling at that time uh, humbled out, which is what we already knew going in, which is why uh, the most high said, you know, hey, you're going to go and purge the land pretty much. And so uh, <clears throat> that whole 40 years through the wilderness was was a preparation to go into the land and take it and not follow in the ways of uh, what people were doing in the land, because that's why they were getting kicked out. So um, it's kind of like a, almost like a surreal thing as far as like how we go from taking the land, doing right, and then, you know, seemingly follow it in the same ways because we were disobedient right off the bat and not even destroying uh, all those nations which we which were supposed to. So um yeah very it was it was like I said it's like a surreal thing just like how 40 years you know, telling us hey don't do this don't do this don't do this most of the laws and statutes that we have is mm -hmm. based on what other nations were doing and so to go yeah. into the land and follow suit it was just every time I read it it's just heartbreaking you know but, so what would you say that Abba made the transition to go from the Melchizedek priesthood to the Levitical priesthood? Was that always from scripture? Do we see that that was always on the game plan? No, no, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It definitely, it definitely wasn't a game plan from the beginning. So we go to, let's go to Exodus, what it says, 24 maybe? <clears throat> yeah, it wasn't a game plan from the beginning. The game plan... From the beginning was what we would read in Exodus 19, where we were going to be a kingdom of priests. And so Aaron was always going to be the high priest, but he was going to be the high priest under a Melchizedek system. We yeah. don't see the, the ushering in of the Levitical priesthood until after the uh the golden calf situation. So hmm. after that, we see a uh and it's actually pretty when you read it, you can see it clearly, but a lot of people don't catch it that. The first covenant that he makes with Israel, when Moses goes up to the mount, he receives the commandments. That first covenant was according to the Melchizedek order. It was when he saw he, when he saw the golden calf being made. Remember, Moses breaks those commandments, right? And then he uh, 
Uh, he breaks the commandments, takes the cab, right? He crushes that down, forces the people to, uh, to you know, eat it or drink it, you know, whatever. And then after that, what we see uh, him do is go back up. He goes back up to the mount. He gets a new set of commandments, and then he makes a covenant according to the Levitical priesthood after that. So the <laughs> first covenant that the Most High made with us was actually according to the Melchizedek order. But then, in the scriptures tell you, it says, this is the covenant that I made with your fathers, and that covenant they broke, right? That covenant they they break, and that was literally what happened when uh, Moses came down off the mount. That was the covenant that the Most High was making with us, but yeah. we broke it almost immediately. You know what I'm saying? And so from that point forward, he was like, "Okay, every man can't be a priest of his own household because these people are wicked." And so there's gonna be a, um, oh man, it's so it's so crazy because. When, he, when we came out of the land, remember, he says, every all the firstborn of uh, man and beast is, was going to be redeemed to him, right? It was mm -hmm. going to be set apart for him. He later changes that and says, no longer is it going to be the firstborn of every household, but it's going to be the firstborn of every Levite. And so he switches it because of uh, the establishment of the Levitical priesthood. Hmm. Um, say yeah, Exodus. so yeah, Exodus. I want to say it's 24. Hold on, uh, see. see, I've got 19 up on the screen. <sighs> Right, yeah. So when he says you're going to be a kingdom of priests, this was the uh, pretty much the Melchizedek, you know, order in effect. We were going to be a kingdom of priests. Every man was going to be a priest according to his own household. Um, and of course, uh, there was still going to be a high priest who was going to do the uh, the ministry of the of the tabernacle pertaining to the tabernacle. So you still were going to have something set up where. Aaron was going to take the sacrifices and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But this was going to be just Aaron and his sons. It wasn't going to be the whole Levitical priesthood. Um, so then was Aaron just be sitting in the Levitical? Was Aaron to sit in the, the high priest seat? And what, Moses would be the Melchizedek priest? No, that... Aaron was going to be the that priest. He was going to be the high priest. Hmm. Uh, Moses, Moses it, it was a weird situation because we don't really find out what Moses, what his role was going to be outside of leading the people to the land because um, he didn't make it. But uh, if you look at their relationship when they dealt with Pharaoh, you really had it as um, Moses was Elohim, and then you had Aaron who was the high priest or the uh he was the high priest and he was the prophet so if you look at it in in a sense of the godhead moses was abba he was yah and then aaron was hamashia like that was their role they wow. were they were that were one so you have moses who would receive a word from yah right and then he would give that word to aaron and then aaron would give the word to pharaoh right which we see when the god how the godhead operates you got abba Gives the word to Hamashiach, Hamashiach then gives the word to us by way of his rock of death. So True. that was kind of the system that was set up. Um, but when it comes to Moses, Moses wasn't going to be, he wasn't going to be a priest. Uh, he wasn't going to be the high priest. It was going to be Aaron. Uh, and then we see even when the Levitical priesthood is set up, Moses uh, um, at a certain point can no longer even go into the tabernacle. Only Aaron um, and his sons can. So uh, he's not even allowed in there. Um, all right, so Exodus 29 is what I was actually looking for. 29? So Exodus 29 and we can start at 43. So this is after he's given the instruction on how to build the ark, how to build the tabernacle, um, priestly garments, all of that. Right. And the last statement that he makes is, and there I will meet with the children of Israel. 
and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory, and I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office, and I will dwell among the children of Israel to be their God, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So the purpose was is that we were going to literally have a camp that was set up and smack dab in the middle of the camp was going to be God's tabernacle. Hmm. Like that was going to, it was, that's how it was going to be designed. After we committed the transgression, you'll see that after that, that Yah says no longer can my tabernacle be amongst his people because of their unrighteousness. Meaning that yeah. if I was up here before them in the middle of the camp, they'd be destroyed. You know what I'm saying? So he was like, from now on, whenever you stop and I request uh, to speak with anybody, you have to go without the camp and then pitch uh, the tabernacle. And so from that point forward, we see his tabernacle being pitched outside of the camp and mm -hmm. then Aaron or Moses having to go before the tabernacle instead of being in the midst of it. So the whole purpose was that he was going to dwell with us in the midst of us and then every man was going to be, like I said, a priest of his own house. Um, but <laughs> work yeah because we see some immediate fall offs we see cora and his family fell off we see aaron his sons they fell off hmm. yeah you see you see a lot of uh a lot of destruction throughout i mean nobody who, who left made it so you see a lot of you see a lot of destruction you see the uh uh the whole situation with Balaam. um like just just throughout the whole the whole walk you just see constant disobedience and, and that's why uh, the Levitical priesthood that had to be set up. It was a placeholder because uh, we just didn't understand at that point who y'all was and what he was doing for us. Like we weren't going to stop sinning just because y'all brought us out of Egypt. That should have been enough. All the miracles and everything that he showed us, it should have been enough to where not that we didn't sin because everybody's going to fall short. But mm -hmm. he, what he saw in us was that we were going to sin repeatedly and not give a crap, like not care. Which we did. You know what I'm saying? Like, when yeah. the Levitical priesthood was set up, even with the Levitical priesthood, if you think about how righteous it is, this is what Paul was talking about. Like, the law is righteous, it's holy, it's spiritual. Very carnal. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, yeah. even if you think about the Levitical priesthood, the moment I bring a, a bullock up there and I have to kill it because of something that I did, that should have been enough. Right? But for yeah. us, we were doing premeditated sin. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like it was, it was almost like, hey man, I got five lambs, two turtle doves. You know what I'm saying? And a bullock for what I got planned tonight. You know what I'm saying? Like that was our mindset. And so, um, the Levitical priesthood was needed until a more better priesthood and a better priest, a better sacrifice could be ushered in. Now it is obtainable by all, but at the same time there is more of a responsibility and it's not just based on you being blood born Israelites, which is what Levitical priesthood was based on. Yeah. You circumcise a day, hey, you, uh, you, you're a blood born Israelite, right? This is, this is your kingdom, this is your priesthood. Now it's like, uh, you gotta, you gotta be born again. Like you literally have to become a new creature and then this, this pertains to you or else he don't know you. You know what I mean? So it's a, it's a, more excellent priesthood and, and more specific, more righteous. So the stakes get raised because not only is not only is it enough for the most high to save us, but then we have to show that we're willing to actually humble ourselves down and listen. Mm -hmm. hmm. She's more than meeting us halfway because Yeah, I'll wake you up, but you still have to show that you're willing to walk this out. Because there is no like we always ask, or like we always discuss, there is no sacrifices anymore you can't just go out and kill animals right you literally have to kill yourself from being what's not you yep yeah. interesting mm -hmm. so those few sins in the beginning when did you come across this information that this was the that they were meant to be the Melchizedek priesthood and then it transformed into Leviticus because we see a changing of it, that's what I was going to go to next. So we go to, um, I'm going to have to look this one up. Because what we see is a, a change in uh, the offering. So when we look at the dedication when we were coming out, there is mm -hmm. a reason why the Most High required 
the firstborn of every uh of every uh creature like the firstborn coming out of egypt were going to be dedicated to him the purpose mm -hmm. was that they were going to be priests like they were going to be uh um priests according to their tribes so every tribe was going to have um they were going to have priests like they were going to have people who represent their tribe and then when we look at uh it's in leviticus but i, I just gotta find it um where he says no more do i want this he said but now i require um now i require the uh the firstborn of the levites only and that was a changing of the priesthood and there's a lot more that goes into it too because he also talks about on the second covenant when he goes back up and gets the commandments he brings them down so hold on one step at a time is it leviticus 8 uh, let's see. Let's see. Get the entrance for a rap maybe. Let's see. Let's see everything commanded with Moses. Let's see. Hold on. Let's go to the public for the temporary. Oh, man. So ordination. Pre sin offering, which is let's see, Leviticus 8. Pre sin offering, there we have family consecration. Okay, uh, all right, numbers. Oh, Lord. It's in Numbers 3. Numbers 3? No yeah. way. Um, you start at 11. So numbers 3 and 11 <clears throat> says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, And I, behold, have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn that opened up the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine because all the firstborn are mine. For on the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I hollow unto me all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. Mine shall they be, I am the Lord. And the Lord <laughs> spake on the most wilderness, and I said, I'm the children. But this, is, this was the switch where originally it was all the firstborn of everything of all the children of israel now he's just saying nope now it's just the levites who are going to be my inheritance right okay. this is why the levites did not get uh they didn't get their own land because they were going to be priests in every land <laughs> and they were yah's inheritance where it was supposed to be every child from uh these tribes it's supposed to be his inheritance so if they picked up on what most i was putting down for them to not have to slaughter the first beast and then the Levites and the first one males doing their part, that would have got them back on the right track. But over time, they continue to go on the wrong track and we've seen the results. So he kept right. altering the plan and that drug the priesthood downward? Or Say that again? I said he kept, alter kept altering the plan, but that kind of, right, it brought the plan downward. He kept having to take the plan downward or stepping down, step from it, from what it was meant to be to meet them where they were right you can say that i mean the the levitical priesthood was still a righteous priesthood it was just mm -hmm. um it was based on carnal ordinances but this is the whole thing because the most time never at this time the melchizedek priesthood is still alive and in effect it's just you have to catch certain ones who operate according to that priesthood so um even though the levitical priesthood is in place you still are going to have people like David, right, who mm -hmm. uh, is judged for adultery. 
right? He, he's punished for committing adultery. But according to what? You know what I'm saying? Nobody ever catches him. He never goes before the high priest. So what does he judge according to, right? But Yah judges him according to the Melchizedek order. Um, you see the same thing with, uh, you see, you honestly see the same thing with Moses when he hits the rock. You know what I'm saying? In his judgment, where there's no law, there's no commandment that he broke, where he would have to bring up a sacrifice. But what was his, what was his transgression that the Most High told him to do something and he disobeyed, right? Yeah. And so because of who he was amongst Israel, he had to be judged accordingly. And so you see these instances where people are still being judged by the Most High because of who he has called them to be um, within the nation. But there's still this Levitical priesthood that is just uh, a placeholder for everybody else who is, I, I guess for lack of a better word, you could say common. Like they're not really aspiring to be, to know Yah. They just want to, they just want to be Israel. So, all right, yeah. if, if you just, hey, you're a blood-born Israelite, there's Levitical priesthood, still got the same feast days, same commandments, all of those. It's just whenever you commit a transgression, instead of coming before me like we do now and repenting, and receiving that forgiveness and then not doing the same sins again, not walking in the same iniquity, it was like, all right, look, this is your sacrifice. Whenever you do it, this is what you got to do. You got to bring this to the priest. They're going to offer this up, and then that will uh, will signify your atonement. But we know that even uh, in Hebrews it says that the reason why we need a Hamashiach is because the person would never, ever become clean. Like they would never ever become purged from any sin. So they would offer this animal up. Yeah, that blood would, would be the placeholder and it would act as an atonement, but you would walk away with the same sin still on your mind. So you were hmm. you were walking around in bondage. You know what I'm saying? Never 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 able to be free, you know what I'm saying, of actual transgression. And so that's why that was just put in place until Hamashiach came. Um and that was that was really the only change that he made, but it wasn't um, the Levitical priesthood didn't supersede the Melchizedek order. It was just something that was it's almost like something that was lower so that, that so that they could they, so that we could survive as a nation. Under the Melchizedek order, we have no chance. You know what I'm saying? Because under the Melchizedek order is um, it's obedience by faith. This is what Abraham did, this is what Isaac did, this is what Jacob did. It was obedience according to faith. You know what I'm yeah. saying? We didn't never see Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob offer any animal for sin, for transgression. They did sacrifice, but it wasn't for sin because they understood that, hey, if I did something wrong and the most I checked me on it, I'm just not going to do that again. You know what I mean? But that just wasn't in our minds to do. So, Perfect. yeah, put this in. So it's like saying the Melchizedek priesthood or the Melchizedek priesthood that order was based on spiritual cleanliness and faithfulness. Whereas the Levitical was to help you get to that point where you could. And that's why we have a Mashiach as that place in between. This is the last sacrifice you're going to get. From here on, if you really want to be clean, you have to clean yourself according to the spirit. You don't have to waste the blood of an animal. You have to be willing to commit yourself spiritually. Right. Hmm. It was a schoolmaster. Um, that's what the Levitical priesthood was designed to do. It was designed to teach, uh, so that we, we would have an understanding of what it takes to, to actually atone for a person, right? Because atonement takes blood. And that's one thing that the most I wanted us to get. And then also just on a lower level, what he requires from his, uh, children. And so when he took the Levites, the Levites were supposed to be the standard Amongst Israel, everybody was supposed to be able to look towards the Levites to see um, what he was trying to do with us as a whole. But that didn't even work because you had crooked Levites. But whenever you were to look at the high priest, this is why he says the Levites are my inheritance, right? They're going to be the ones that uh, belong to me, and I am going to keep them and protect them. And so that's why he required the whole nation to, to pay tithes to them so that they, they never had lack. And they were full-time ministry doing the work that y'all called them to do. Uh, hmm. And so they were supposed to be that standard, that new Torah, right? They were the, they were the Torah scholars because that's all they did. Um, and they understood y'all as far as 
sacrifices as far as what he requires from his priests, as far as being an example to uh, to the nation and um, keeping toward not just according to the flesh, but according to the mind and, and spirit. You know what yeah. I mean? But like I said, we couldn't even do that. So we don't have a which is interesting because nowadays people learn in such linear ways and then we have our minds can like reach out and reach for details mm-hmm. because with the way the West, with the way the word is actually spread out all over the world, so many different aspects of it have been opened up, but not like the true important aspects that really lock you into what this is all about. Mm-hmm. So we don't really have a timeline that says the Melchizedek order stops here. We know when the Levitical priesthood started here, right? Mm-hmm. We mentioned some examples. Uh, Adam, would you say, would be of the Melchizedek order? Yeah. Uh, Noah. But let's see, Adam, Abel? Uh, yeah, before he was murdered. Yeah, you can say that. Seth? Definitely Seth. And these things were passed down. So as long as, let's say, let's say Adam was a Melchizedek, right? Which is just uh, when we say king of righteousness, that is the one who establishes uh, the Most High's his Torah. Mm-hmm. So we say the first one was Adam. Adam passes it on to the next person. That's why I said it, it would have been Abel, but Abel was murdered. So technically, the next Melchizedek would have been Seth, and then Seth would have passed it down to uh, Methuselah. Methuselah would have passed it down to Enoch, right? Enoch was translated. And so mm-hmm. then it moved down to whoever comes after that, which uh, I'm not 100% sure who comes after Enoch, but then eventually we get to Noah, right? And then Noah's that Melchizedek, and then Noah passes it on to Shem, and then Shem is the one who taught Abraham, and then so on and so forth. Is this the importance of the genealogy then, in showing those who, without even being named as under the order, that were under the order? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Because it wasn't a, it wasn't a, you really don't even see, you don't see Melchizedek on the scene until we get to Abraham. Um hmm but that's because we see we see Abraham who is in covenant with Yah. He's the first he's the first person that was taken out and, were, and there was an individual covenant made with him. Where in Noah's case, that covenant was made with mankind. Period. It was made with uh, both man. It was made with both mankind and animals. Right. It was made with the whole world. It actually was made with the earth as well. So when he makes that covenant to say, "I'm no longer going to flood the earth," that is to everything that is living. He's making that covenant too. When we get to Abraham, Abraham was the first person who's drawn out and he actually makes a covenant with just him. So when we see Abraham uh, coming back from delivering Lot or he rescued Lot um, and his whole family and everything like that, then we see him actually interact with Melchizedek because that is his, um, that's his grandfather at the time, which would be Shem. And so uh, when it says that he's king of right, he's the king of righteousness, and he dwells, uh, he dwells in what it says Salem, right? Mm-hmm. Which is he dwells. In, it actually could be translated Shalom, right? So mm-hmm. he's the king of righteousness, and he dwells in the city of peace, right? And this was Shem. He was that one who established that order, and then of course when he passes away, then then now that becomes Abraham, so on. Now, you know, there are those out there that say that Melchizedek, according to the scripture, had no beginning, had no end, right? True. They say a man who had no mother, no father. Mm -hmm. Then there are others who say that Shem occupied the office of Melchizedek. Is there a confusion on what the office is in the spirit versus those who have actually occupied the office in the flesh? Is there a confusion there? It is confusion. It's confusion of what the Melchizedek priesthood is, what the Melchizedek order is. So when we talk about, and I think people get it confused because they look at Melchizedek, they look at Melchizedek as a person. Yeah. So when they say Melchizedek, right, they're like, oh, okay, like his name was Melchizedek. But there's a reason why it gives you the interpretation where it says this is Melchizedek, king of righteousness. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's telling you his position or his authority. But that is just uh, he that position is being filled by an actual person. 
The reason why it has no beginning or ending is because the Melchizedek order comes from the Shemaim. This is why we have a high priest who is now our Melchizedek. But we know that that's not what we called him when he was here. So how is he both? You know what I'm saying? How is he our Melchizedek now? According to Hebrews, right? I believe it's Hebrews chapter 9. How is he now our Melchizedek? But at the same time, we call him uh, Yahushua, Yahushua, you know what I'm saying? Uh, the how is How is that the case, right? So yeah. either this is a order that was set up that was occupied by multiple people or it was an actual person. So if we read the scriptures, then we, we get the understanding that it was a uh, it was an order that was established and people would feel this position. Um, if we look at uh, and it, there are different interpretations of it, too, in the, in the scriptures, like if you look at Jasher, Jasher. It doesn't even say Melchizedek, it says the donors of that, which means uh, Lord of Righteousness. Um, but it's, it's both the same thing. And I say all that just to say it lets you know that it's a position. It's not a actual person. Um, hmm. Because if it was, then the name wouldn't change. It would, be, it would be the same thing no matter where you read it because it's a person's name, right? Moses' name doesn't change. Uh, it may change the way maybe uh, when it comes to dialects, how the name would change. Like we see Elias, but we know it's Elijah. But mm -hmm. um, if you look at the uh, transliteration, it has the same meaning because it's the same, you know, it says the same person. But um, with that being said, when it comes to Melchizedek, it was just an occupied position, and now it's being occupied by Mashiach. Now it's being occupied by, you know, what I'm saying Yahushua. So uh, it's always been that it's not an actual person. That's why it has no beginning or end, no mother or father, because. Um, Melchizedek itself is a order that was established by Yah, and it is given to those who have been chosen uh, to fill that position, to fill that seat. Um, and so, yeah, uh, it's just a misunderstanding. So this is interesting because we have Melech Sedek, right? So I was looking this up. Like I said, I was blowing you up last week, and I started going into what this all means. Uh-huh. So now keep Sedek, we have that hyphenate or that uh that bridge right there. So it comes down to my king is right, an early king of Salem. So then we have Melek, which is king, right? But if we go back, then we have Sedek. And a Sedek is also rightness or righteousness. Uh -huh. So let's see. Uh, <clears throat> and as I was saying, it's no different from it's no difference from uh um when we look at Abimelech in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Abimelech was a title. Um Pharaoh. Pharaoh was the title. We know that the Pharaoh that Moses actually appeared to was uh Ramses, right? That was his actual name, but his title was Pharaoh. And so um it's just a position that's being held. It's a position of authority, but um, it's not a actual. It's not the actual name of person. So, when we look at even those names, uh, when it comes to Abimelech, we see Abimelech in. Uh, we see uh, who is that? Abraham. Abraham. He goes down to Egypt. Uh, he talks to he talks to the Pharaoh uh, when he gives Sarah. He tries to get or. That Pharaoh takes Sarah, you know, he almost touches her, but then the Most High appears before this Pharaoh. Now check this out. When he appears before that Pharaoh, this Pharaoh's, uh, the Pharaoh that he appeared to said, uh, he talked to him first off, and then that Pharaoh said, yeah, will, uh, will you destroy the righteous? Right? Mm -hmm. And so, oh, man, so we actually had a Pharaoh in Egypt that was righteous? So what actually happened? You know what I mean? And then uh, when we get to Abimelech, it was the same thing because Abraham actually went down to Assyri uh, Assyria, I think, to the Assyrians and the Abimelech who was reigning at that time, it was the same thing. Hmm. And so these were just men who occupied a position. Some were righteous, some were wicked. Uh, but all the same, when we get to Judges, we see a Melchizedek, or I believe in there, it, said, it might say Adonazedek, and he's dwelling in what? Satan. Right, he, he's dwelling in Jerusalem, which is the same thing. Slow it down, slow it down. Let's prove all things. We don't want to lose nobody. 
Let's slow it down. Let's go back to, we're talking about Genesis 20 and 10. When we're talking about Abimelech. So, since people love the Strongs, Abimelech, right? Mm -hmm. Strongs 40. Father is king, a Philistine king, also an Israelite name. And then we know Melech, once again, is a king. Mm -hmm. Now let's see Ab, which is interesting because this also goes into Abraham, mm -hmm. which is also father. So it's interesting that Abraham interacted with Abimelech. They're both fathers, but one's a king, though. Right? So it's just interesting how the people that the Most High was dealing with in the early time of man, a lot of things were very what I'm looking for. What's the, the Bible I'm looking for here? People had a lot of sim similar names, but those names had meanings and functions to it. Right. And as you said, this Abimelech was righteous with the Most High because he was actually able to hear from the Most High. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because years later, and I got to thinking about this, that means that Canaan at one point in time was a blessed place. As far as the land, or are you talking about the people? The land. Yeah, the land was always the land was always a uh, it was always a land flow of milk and honey. Uh, nothing changed that because we know that Yah is the one who creates those things. So that mm -hmm. was always a, a bountiful land. It was just being inhabited by wicked people. So that's mm -hmm. why they had to get out of it. Yeah. Hmm. For sure. So. And during the time of the before the Levitical priesthood, this is where this is where we are right now. And we don't have the records of Shem. Well, actually, we got the book of Joshua. Can you bring out mm -hmm. some key things about uh Shem during his time? Ahead, as far as uh during this time period, where we're saying where people are some people are still confused about whether Melchizedek was a person. Or was it a spiritual office for those who are righteous to the Most High, right. who carried out his functions? Like as we named off Noah, Moshe, so many others. Because what we're looking for is where the Melchizedek order stops and where the Levitical priesthood goes forth. But even with the Levitical priesthood, are there any righteous Levitical priests that really yeah, stand out from the scriptures? Yeah, of course. Uh, Samuel was a Levitical priest. He was righteous. Um, you had Eli, who was righteous up until up until his son started wilding out, and then you know I said, of course, the Most High had to cast judgment on him. But uh, if we look at if we look at First Samuel, um, Hannah she gives her she gives Samuel over to Eli to be raised up. So Eli is the one who actually raised up Samuel to know Torah. And to uh to learn Yah's voice. Like he was the one he literally taught him how to hear his voice. When Most High was calling out to him and he kept coming to Eli, and Eli was like, I didn't call you. And then he was just like, Well, I keep hearing the voice. And he was like, Well, the next time I say here I am, right? And then he calls out to him again, he says, Here I am or here am I, and then the most high starts to talk to him. So uh yeah, Eli was definitely um he was definitely righteous for sure. Uh Samuel was righteous. Um and then of course you had just during the time of first and second kings, you had many righteous priests who were companions to righteous kings because they really both had to run at the same time. So if you think about it, if I'm a righteous king and I'm taking over like a Hezekiah and I come into office and you're a wicked priest, then you're getting dealt with. All right. Give me a second. Now. Give me a second. Now. Give me a second. All right. Come on, come on. This conference will now be recorded. So, you're saying how the orders run concurrent, or what's the word, concurrent to each other? Yeah. Yeah. But the one order was supposed to stop, and the next order was supposed to continue on. Everybody was supposed to, as you said, the Levitical was for the common, right? Mm -hmm. But then if we see the higher order, it's almost like comparing high school to college, or even... I say even college rather to a master or a doctor. Nah, for sure. For sure. It was a different different level of understanding. 
So it wasn't something that most people would catch or even, like I said, like even inspire to do because the Melchizedek order wasn't something that like Abraham didn't acknowledge. He never acknowledged this is what I'm, I'm under the Melchizedek order. It was like, no, I follow God. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Isaac, same thing with Jacob. You know what I'm saying? It was a different understanding. Same thing with Joseph. Like, I, no, I follow the most high. Like, this is my God and I'm, I'm serving him with all my, you know what I'm saying, my, my mind, body and soul pretty much. Just like the most high so that's doing we came out of Egypt, laying out those Ten Commandments, right? I'm your Elohim that brought you out of the land of Egypt. You know what I'm saying? You should have no other gods before me, so on and so forth. Like, this is what he called us to do. We just couldn't we couldn't fulfill it. Like those ten basic principles we could not do. Like we just could not stop, you know what I'm saying, with the sinning. Like like I said, he told us straight up not to not to worship idols, not to build any any image, and then as soon as Moses goes up to the mount, he's gone for 40 days, and that's exactly what they do. So seeing that, it was like, oh, man, yo, this people is, it was like, they are really wicked. Like, that's, that's different. It ain't like, oh, Abraham seeing a famine and then going down to Egypt. Like, nah, this is something different. Like, literally, they doing something to provoke me to rap. Like, you never see Abraham intentionally do something to make y'all mad. Neither do you see that with Isaac. Neither do you see that with Jacob. You see misunderstandings and a lack of faith based on outside circumstances but not an intent to make that like that's yeah. just crazy you know so if you think about it with a child it's, it's the same thing a child that messes up sometimes but for the most part they just try to do right and every now and then they slip up you can give them a pass like it, you know i don't need you to bring a sacrifice for me like i can give you a pass but a child is just obedient it's just like man you constantly got to take stuff away then when they do good, you get stuff back. Then when they, like, you know what I mean? It's just a yeah. different, it's, it's more strenuous because it's just like, man, you really got to do more to keep them in check. That's what the Levitical priesthood was. In order to keep us in check, that thing, those, those sacrifices had to be there, those ordinances had to be there for us or else, you know what I'm saying, we would have just continued to do wickedness. Like, it would have been no accountability. And that's what the Levitical priesthood was. But there were some who rose above that and didn't need that accountability because they understood who Yah was, you know. So, uh, you know, again, going back to Samuel, Samuel understood who Yah was. When the people asked for a king, he was like, "Are y'all crazy? Like, we got Yah. Like, he's <laughs> he's our our Elohim." He was just like, "No, just chill." He was like, "They they coming at me, not you. Like, I'll give him a king, you know." So, it's just a different level of understanding, which is how you know they were just on a higher they were walking according to something that was above um, cardinal sacrifices and cardinal ordinances. Hmm. So, okay. I would give them Levit Levitical priesthoods in order. Melchizedek has never been really dissolved. The people just never gained the spiritual understanding of what it was. Then all of a sudden now the people want a king. Mm -hmm. So then okay. Melchizedek meant king of righteousness. So then we do we see the most high establishing a kinghood as what's all meant to be kind of like a Melchizedek king, someone who would follow the most high spiritually and then would have a high priest right there also to match up the works. I'm trying to think of the right way to phrase that. Um, because he gave them the office of king, right? Mm -hmm. But how is the office of the king supposed to work with the high priest? The king is still under the high priest spiritually, but he's the authority over the land, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if, if you think about it in terms of a government, it's just like uh, you have your high priest who is still going to deal with the sacrifices. He's still going to um, he's still going to deal with all things Torah. You know what I'm saying? He's going to deal with um, sacrifices, feast days, uh, you know, any type of illnesses, leprosy, things like that. He's still going to deal with those those things concerned in the Torah. The mm -hmm. king was only meant to rep to be a judge. So the king was going to judge all matters um, according to Torah. So he, he had to know Torah 
as well. And he was going to be the judge because that's what the people wanted. There were offenses happening. The, the whole the whole King situation happened because Eli's sons, who were priests, were doing wickedness, right? They were perverting judgment. They were um, they were stealing from the people, like all of that stuff like that. So, and it's not that Yah didn't judge them. He did. Right? All three of them, Eli and his two sons, they all got judged and they all end up dying. But for the people, they was just like, and that just in normal fashion, how we do, it ain't happening fast enough, right? We want somebody who, when we see these things happening, we can go before him and then air out our grievances and have him judge the situation right then and there. And so they started asking for a king because this is what the other nations had. Even though Yah was the one who was judging the people at that time, because it wasn't in their time, they were just like, ah, nah, we, get it. We, want, we want a physical king, something tangible. And so that's why King Saul was put into position to be that. Um, but he was the king that the people sought after. Later on, we see that David is the king that Yah chooses because he has a heart after him. And so even though King uh, Kings, you can say King Saul was supposed to represent that Melchizedek order as far as judgment is concerned and being a standard, mm -hmm. um, David truly represented that. Saul had the opportunity, he, he stumbled. Uh, but David truly represented just that, for sure. Hmm. And then, of course, we see the office of the king change after David dies. Solomon started off in his prominence. With, we say Solomon was under... Yeah, Solomon, Kelly, definitely yeah. said he was. Hmm. For sure. For sure. Um, because of David, because of David, he was for sure he was. He was held to that higher standard, which is why the penalty for what he did was so great, uh, and that he literally rent the kingdoms. Um, hmm. So yeah, you you for sure he was, for sure he was. Yeah. So after Solomon falls, and we don't see anyone occupy the Melchizedek order. Well, after Solomon falls, well, I take that back. I'm getting ahead of myself because there are prophets who do stand in the order of the Most High, and when we say they represent aspects of the Melchizedek order, because most prophets who can, would you say most prophets who can heal, and get a word directly from the Most High, are under the Melchizedek order? Yeah, the the ones that we know of that were, uh, I would definitely say Elijah, uh, Elias, uh, you know it, Isaiah, Jeremiah, like all of these guys. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and this is what I'm saying, like, they were called, so if you think about their, the mantle that they had to carry, and this is why, this is why when we think about Hamashiach, think about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, like, all of this stuff starts to come together. Think about the mantle that they had to carry. They had to go before the priests and the kings and prophesy judgment and repentance. Like, this was yeah. what they were called to do. And so this is what this is how you know that they were on a higher level because they were called to, to be judges of those who were um, who were, who were walking in wickedness. And because of that, it, when you think about just the very term king of righteousness, like they were sent to establish righteousness. They were sent to preach righteousness and a call to repentance. And that's pretty much what that that Melchizedek is going to represent. He's going to be the one that maintains keeps order uh so when you don't have that then you see just chaos and you know perversion and you know all of those things going on but uh yeah definitely the prophets would definitely fill that that space uh for, for yeah they would definitely fill that space i would definitely i would definitely say that and the thing the beautiful thing about melchizedek is it's not dependent upon a tribe or anything like that it really is just who, whoever you got calls and then Obedience. Yeah, obedience. That's it. Obedience by faith. You know what I'm saying? Just doing what the most high tells you to do. And um, you know, that's important when you think about people like Hosea who had to marry a prostitute, like things like that. Like is he if, if the most high like anybody else today, we would look at that person and be like, Man, come on, bro, that's wicked. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But the most high literally told him to do that, but there was a reason for it and he prophesied that. So um yeah. These things, these things were definitely by obedience 
and not just by commandment, which is what Levitical priesthood was based on. Here are the commandments, here are the laws, do it. You know what I'm saying? The Melchizedek order was like, no, hear me, and then do. You know what I mean? Because I'm going to tell you some things <laughs> that are going to seem a little, hey, huh? You want me to do what? Yeah. Yeah. Get their attention. Mm hmm Get their attention before I have to bring the wrath on them. Right. Hmm. So the king is established, and the priest, well, see, okay. It gets a little interesting because if the higher prophets who are supposed to work with the king to make sure that there's order established in the land. And let's see. Where do we see? Do we say that uh, Zechariah was a Levitical priest? Uh, Zechariah was a prophet. He wasn't a he wasn't a priest at the time that Zechariah was prophesying. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a high priest uh, named Joshua, um, who was there around that time. He was the high priest. Hmm. I'm trying to see in the scriptures where there are major points where, as Israel is going through its growth, I guess, in people, but also growth in experiences, really, how pretty much. Brought down with the most I was constantly trying to establish with them. Because if you don't have someone representing the Bikizadek order and the people aren't understanding that, we see that they slowly started deteriorating. Right. The kings went off. After Solomon, the kings went off. Actually, during Ahab's time, prophets become start becoming like pray for the people. During Ezekiel's time, people were disrespecting the prophets, whereas one point in time, they wouldn't have done that years, hundreds of years earlier with Samuel. Mm -hmm. So, when do we see the major transition where the priesthood is not being effective with the people? For Levitical? For mm -hmm. Levitical or, or Levitical? Yeah. Right off the bat, like it was never, and that's the thing, like because it was it was based on on men, like like so this is the this was the I guess I don't want to say flaw because there was no flaw with the priesthood. Just like like if we think about uh in the terms of the United States, right? There's there's really no issue with the laws, it's just the people who have to who have to enact them. That's what the problem is, right? Um and that's, I'm saying that loosely because there are some laws that are definitely, uh, <laughs> but when right. we talk about like it's foundational, yeah. uh, just for, just for uh, experimental purpose, like just for, you know, argument's sake. When it comes to the laws, yeah, when it comes to the laws of the United States, most of the time we see them perverted or misused by the people who have to enforce them. Mm -hmm. And so because of the Levitical priesthood, there's nothing wrong with the Torah. There's nothing wrong with the laws. It was just the people were put in place to enforce it, i.e. Nadab and Abayu. Nadab and Abayu, or I would say the Levitical priesthood had nothing to do with you being righteous. Hmm. It was based on you being a Levite. And so because of that, a high priest had nothing to do with you being righteous. It was just based on you being a descendant of Aaron, yeah. i.e. Aaron was even judged for, <laughs> for unrighteousness. Yeah. So when you look at the Levitical priesthood, it was it was by bloodline. And so you would have some that were good. And you had a lot that were bad because there was no determination as far as, oh, this individual is righteous, so that's going to be the high priest. No. Hey, you're a descendant. You're the closest descendant of Aaron. You're the high priest. That's it. And <laughs> you could be, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we put it in modern terms, you could be a drug dealer coming off the street. And it's like, hey, if you're that descendant of Aaron, hey, give him his garments. You're the high priest now. You know what I mean? Now, you still got to obey the commandments as far as going in the tabernacle and the holies and the holies because you go in there with the wrong heart, the wrong mindset, you definitely getting done. Like, you've done it, yeah. So hmm. to a certain extent, they had to be obedient, but as far as their heart was concerned, it wasn't predicated on them being righteous or trying to be righteous. So we got a lot of priests that were uh, wicked. The Melchizedek order is not so because the Melchizedek, Melchizedek order is based upon, you are chosen based upon your desire to be righteous. So mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with who your daddy is. It don't matter, you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. 
who you learn from, whatever. It was all about the most high seeing your heart and seeing your righteousness and calling you to that higher standard. Same thing today, right? Not everybody can receive the Ruach, right? It's given to those who have a desire uh, to pursue the most high, to, to uh, walk in righteousness. You can, yeah. you can talk talk all you want, but if it ain't in you, then he ain't giving it to you. You know what I mean? So um, You literally yeah. have to point yourself out if you really want to achieve it. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So that puts uh, that puts Exodus back on the map where it says that being a nation of priesthood, Kamashak made a way where if you're going to continue to follow his ways, there is a way to be as he is. Mm-hmm. As if you can earn it over time, you might not see it at the end of this life, this physical lifetime, but we don't know what happens on the other side of judgment. Right. Hmm. That was always there. It was always put in place. Um, it never went away. The Even the scriptures tell you the law is for the unrighteous. Yeah. The law is for the wicked. It's not for the righteous. So if you truly had just, just a righteous heart, righteous intent, then you are above the law, and the most I can use you in a more effective way. Um, when you look at Joshua, you know what I'm saying? Joshua, who took over from Moses. Joshua was, when we look at Joshua, and he don't really get enough credit, we, we bypass him a lot. When you look mm-hmm. at Joshua, Joshua never really committed a sin that's documented. Like, if that's- you read his book, if you read Exodus, yeah, if you read the Torah, and you read Joshua, you never, like, we don't see where he did anything wrong. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like he he was like the definition of perfect through his generations. And of course, maybe he slipped up here and there and it just it just was never chronicled. But it's like, man, when you look at his walk, like it was it was pretty much perfect. Like that thing was, I mean, he was to the end, to the casket drop, he was on it. Um True. and so he would have been above that, like he would have been. That authority. This is why when he died, everything just went to hell to hell in the handbasket. You know what I'm saying? As soon as he passed on, you just saw everybody just going crazy. And then we have judges. That's what that is. <laughs> A cycle of sin and redemption. Hmm. So yeah. Hmm. Any key points you want to bring up from uh the book of Jasher? Um because that's another book that most people don't take the time to really go investigate and get a better understanding of. All right, so here, we'll do this. Let's go. You can pull up, Jasher? Uh, let me know what website to go to. I'll pull it up. I don't know if I got it either. Hold up. Because if not, I can just, I can just highlight it, which is it's really just Jasper 16, where it just tells you that um, Adonis Adek or Melchizedek was Shem and that he taught of Abram. But um, what I really want to go to in order to kind of put the nail in this, because this is something that we got to remember. Mm-hmm. And this is when we read through the scriptures, it's easy to tell that Melchizedek is not a person because, like I said, it, it, it's given to Amashiach, right? Um, so we look at, uh, let's see, Psalms 110. Now, it's interesting you say that because it's not a person, because you see with the Levitical priesthood, it's off the tribe of Levi, right? Right. But Melchizedek is different in that aspect. Or... If there ever was a representation of Melchizedek, it would all least have been the word, which would be Yahshua. Mm-hmm. That's peace. So, well. Right, right. So when we look at the term Melchizedek, and then we think about um, in earth as it is in heaven, right? The term mm-hmm. Melchizedek, king of righteousness, it comes from the Shemayim. It is Abba. He is the king of righteousness. There's only one, right? So uh, anybody down here to get themselves that title, hey, you, hey, you talk about mostly bragging. (laughs) You call yourself the king of righteousness. That's crazy. So there's only one king of righteousness, and we know that that's Abba. So this had to be something that was given to somebody saying that you're going to walk under this order, and this is what you're going to be known as, which is Melchizedek. But um, 
the the standard was always going to be is always going to be Hamashiach, uh, which is why when he came down, it, he was that example. Like he was that he was that ultimate you know, because of that, that ultimate king of righteousness, never committing a transgression and then laying down his life and raising up to power. But this is what I'm saying. Like, if he was a Melchizedek, if he was a Melchizedek, when we read back with Abraham, right? Then why is it in Hebrew? Is it is it now saying that he's now the Melchizedek? Like, why is it talking about it in that sense? Why is it not saying, oh, this was that Melchizedek, right? But it's telling you that no, this Melchizedek has no beginning, no end in the days, no mother, no father, all of this mm -hmm. stuff, right? Which is how we know it comes from the heavens, because it has no beginning, no end. Just like Abba has no beginning, no end. But it's True. saying that because he came down in the flesh, committed no transgression, and then he died, and now he has risen, he is now our high priest and our king of righteousness. He is now the mark. And so, uh, and of course, it's prophesied in uh, Psalms 110 by David, who had this understanding. And that's all like, <laughs> man, it, it's, 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 if we could just understand, like, it's an order, just like Levitical order, like, every priest is not, that's not Levi. His name's not Levi, right? But he's coming, he's coming after the tribe of Levi. So you, you think about Melchizedek, every Melchizedek was coming after, um, or they were a representation of um, the actual king of righteousness. That was their, that was their position. And it would just pass on and pass on. Um, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit down on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send a rod of, of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. The people shall be willing in the day of thy power and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, right? Mm -hmm. So he said that this person is going to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. But if Amashiach was Melchizedek back then, then why is he a priest after the order of Melchizedek? So it tells you he is a priest after what has been established in Shemaim, what has been established in the heavens. He's a prince after an order that has been everlasting, that has never, it has no beginning, no ending, no mother, no father. He is yeah. He is the everlasting priest after that order, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I wish I knew how to put it more more plainly, but well, yeah. Being Abba's son, his only begotten son that Abba would trust, or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's the best way to really say it, right? Because he's going to do. He doesn't know. Even Yahshua admitted. Even Mashiach admitted that. Even he doesn't know the time and the place where Abba would do certain things. But Abba did trust him enough to have come in the flesh and then to have been translated into a glorified body to actually operate here. So if Abba is the king of righteousness and Yahshua is the high priest of righteousness, you see what the deal right there. Everybody else has to walk, as we said, everybody else has to meet up to that standard now. You can't go slaughter an animal. You know, you have to break yourself down and look, this is me. That's what I'm going through. I need to repent. I need to get right. Who do I go to? I go to Yahshua. Mm -hmm. He'll let you know if your prayers are right. He's uh, he taught us how to pray and everything. Mm -hmm. He's everything. He's all in one. But I say he's, he's a sacrifice. He's a king. He's the high priest. He's everything. He's all in, he's all in one. Hmm. Let's see. Any key points from the book of Joshua? I've got uh chapter sixteen pulled up. If you want it. Um, uh, yeah. This, well, I just wanted to show that there was um there was Shem and then um, I was gonna go to Psalms one ten and then uh we could definitely read uh Hebrews seven and then hopefully that'll give a clear understanding. Um but it shows you that it said uh, don't in the dome is it that this is Joshua 16 11. I got you right. Yeah. 
Here we go. Matthew 16 and 11. All right. I mean, and we know, I mean, we just know that Shem has a beginning and an end of days, right? Because I know it was his father, and then we actually have its own record when he when he dies. So we know that this can't be talking about Melchizedek because he does have a beginning and an end it. So it has to be something more. Um, but it says, in Adonazedek, king of Jerusalem, uh, the same with Shem went out with his men to meet Abram and his people with bread and wine, and they were made together in the valley of Malet. And Adonis the deck blessed Abram, and Abram gave him a tenth from all that he had that he had brought from the spoil of his enemies, for Adonis the deck was a priest before God. All right, so again, the Melchizedek was exactly what Hamashiach is today, all that. He hmm. is the priest, he is the uh he is the king. He, uh, and then with Hamashiach, Hamashiach is the sacrifice as well. So this is why he is, he's hes the perfect one. He is the, the unblemished lamb. He, he is the mark. <clears throat> so do we see any bad aspects of the Melchizedek order at all? Do we see any bad aspects of that? No. If we judge the Levitical order according to what we have in the text, do we see any bad aspects from that? Not the order, but the people that maintain the order. Right, yeah, because it, like I said, it wasn't based on, there was no criteria. It wasn't based on righteousness. It was based on lineage and bloodhood. That would have, that would have been the only downfall, but that's something that the Most High already is aware of. But it had to be put in place or else, like I said, we were done for. Um. We couldn't, hmm. we couldn't attain that Melchizedek threshold. Like, we couldn't get there. Uh, we just weren't, it wasn't in us. It was in our heart to only do wickedness. So we had to have that priesthood set up, uh, which in Hebrews, it tells you this was the shadow of things to come. This was supposed to be a representation of what we were supposed to be walking in, but also mm -hmm. what was going to be, what was going to come when Hamashiach arrived on the scene. He said Hebrews 7, correct? Hebrews chapter 7 and Paul gives a breakdown here of the Melchizedek priesthood versus the Levitical priesthood and kind of the difference um, of them both and you know, why it was important for the Melchizedek order uh, to be the prominent order that we're in now <clears throat> and I stated it before it, it was basically because the Levitical priesthood couldn't make you perfect. You couldn't. You could not. You could not be fully righteous under that that priesthood. Um, so it says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and afterwards also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, right? We know that, that Shem had a, had a father and he had a mother, True. Uh, without descent, uh, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abiding a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they came out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted for them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here... Men that die receive tithes, but there he received them of who it of who it is witnessed that he lived. And as I may say, as I may so say, Levi also who received tithes paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Mm -hmm. Therefore, perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it people received the law. What further need was there that another priest uh, should rise after the order? Another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. All right, so you see the difference in one 
order of Melchizedek, order of Aaron, which is uh, the Levitical priesthood. True. Um, so you have these orders that are established, and then you have priests within these orders. And so this lets you know that it's not a physical person that has always occupied that. Not one, not one physical person that's always occupied uh, that person, or who has went by the name uh, Melchizedek. It's always just been a title. Hmm. <clears throat> All right, so where are we at? 12. So it says, for the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity of change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaining to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Mm -hmm. And it is yet far more evident, for that after, after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest, who was made not after the law of carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. So there's the difference in that biblical priesthood. You were priest by commandment and that as long as you were of uh, the Levites, high priest, as long as you were a descendant of Aaron, that was what got you in a position where this position under Melchizedek um, was by power of an endless life, right, which we know is Abba. So to be a Melchizedek, you would be given power by the one who was in the heavens. And yeah. there was... Uh, you know, you had to be righteous. You had to be a righteous brother. You were chosen to, to fill this spot. Hmm. Um, let's see where we at. 17, for he testified, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is barely a disannulling of the commandment going before the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, still doesn't. But the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests, uh, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continued with uh, ever, have an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he liveth to make intercession for them. But such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made <laughs> higher than the heavens who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. But the word of oath, which was since the law, maketh the son who was consecrated evermore. Hmm. Well, it's a whole lot, but it definitely shows you the separation between the two, and yeah. it shows you the uh, it shows you the I guess the majesty of the Melchizedek order and how much higher it was than the Levitical priesthood. Um, yeah. That's it. One was meant to bring about graduation, right? <laughs> to obey the Most High as your Father, and not have to slaughter an innocent animal because you have the self control now. Just like the Masha had self-control. We already know he could have wiped out the scribes and the Pharisees. Many of the prophets have had Abba's touch. But they only operated under what Abba told them to do was tell the people to repent and obey. And if you really want to translate it simply is follow the loving instructions. So that way the life that Abba wants us to have will be returned back to us. Right. Hmm. Simple but deep. Yep, yep, well said. And this is this was what if we if we look at Amashiach, he never had to bring one sacrifice. Never had nope. to bring up one sacrifice. And he walked according to the Levitical priesthood. He did everything according to the Levitical priesthood. He even died according to the Levitical order. You know, this is why he was examined by the priest. And then when the priest found him guilty, even though he was without blemish, and they offered him up to be sacrificed. So he was yeah. even sacrificed according to the Levitical priesthood, which was it makes it so uh just so man 
it's just a beautiful thing how how it went down. Hmm. So, any other key thoughts on the Melchizedek priesthood? Mm -hmm. Walk in it. So. so then, this leads us into our next part, which we'll have to examine what happened with the Levitical priesthood. Because let's see, an obvious question: Will we say the scribes and the Sadducees came from the Melchizedek priesthood or from Levitical priesthood? Definitely Levitical. And that's a whole that's a whole calamity that happened over the centuries. That's gonna be a lot of unpacking because one thing we can say about the scribes and the Pharisees and those who felt like they were doing things according to their righteousness, they did try to cover their tracks. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. But if I was telling us that our righteousness is as filthy rags, then it was easy for them to find those tracks and leave us record of what was going on, even if they tried mm -hmm. to hide our history. Oh, man. So that would be the first part of the righteous priesthood. And we're not saying that the Levitical priesthood was wrong. We're not saying that it's bad. It's just that you can't operate in that. You can't operate in the Levitical priesthood with a half heartedness and a half half mind, half heart. You can't serve two masters. You can't without even knowing it, you can't be a priest for Abba, but then be doing the will of Hasatan. Right. Big contradiction there. Yeah, but, and it definitely, anything the Most High puts in place is definitely not wicked because there's no unrighteousness in them. So mm -hmm. the political priesthood was definitely a righteous thing and it was meant to be righteous and could have been. But, of course, the hearts and minds of men, they're the ones who pervert what Yah puts in place. So that's, that's always been the case. It's never what Yah deems or what he ordains is always people just taking it and then perverting it, right? They do it even with this doctrine that we have in front of us. They take that, put it in the hands of and uh put it in the hands of wicked men, and they're gonna do wickedness with it. And uh, that's always the case. So the Levitical priesthood was definitely spiritual. It was meant to be hmm. um meant to be righteous. And like I said, those Levitical priests were meant to be the standard in every nation, in every tribe. They were meant to be the standard in all lands of what the Most High required, which is why they were his inheritance. And he made it known, he's, this is my inheritance. They belong to me. And they were supposed to show forth his example, but they did, most, for the most part. You got to say hallelujah, because Abba is always taking us to school. Because what you just said right there is he gave them a chance to come out of high school, grade school, be the examples. Because if the people are going before these priests, and it's just a trick of the enemy how it actually fell apart, though. They came out of Mitzrayim with a lot more on them that they didn't know how to give up on. And that's what we have nowadays. We get the chance to really expose ourselves and see, is this the real me or is this, who does Abba want me to be? Right. Which is worth more. Because this version of me only gets 120 years. Maybe you might get 120 years. No guarantee. But if I push myself, I get eternal life to go and find out what's next that the most high has and that's a true graduation from not having to commit, commit any carnal sacrifice but let me control myself mm -hmm. let me hear you let me be your family let me be your son or your daughter to walk with you and find out what this is really all about instead of having to try to justify a fallen state because the one that's over that fallen state the Prince of the air doesn't even claim us, doesn't even like us. Right. Because he loves company. Right. So we're not knocking the Levitical priesthood. We're just talking about human frailty. And Hamasha showed us how we can redeem ourselves, but we just have to be willing to clean ourselves out and stay clean. It's like I was talking to you last week, how we have to come off our addictions. Because if we're addicted to our afflictions, there's confusion in there. I think I'm doing good. Everybody's evil against me. It's their fault. Because I'm doing good, right? My evilness, it's not so bad. Everybody does evil. You need evil with good. These are the things that we tell ourselves, and it just it doesn't make sense. Nope. Ah. <sighs>
So we have to expose what happened with the Levitical priesthood and how we ended up with scribes. Well, not scribes, but Pharisees and Sadducees. Yeah, yeah, we go through uh, we go through the apographer, hit that up. It'll it'll point to the I guess the start of it and the intent behind it, uh, which was not unrighteous. It's like you know most things that we establish uh, when it comes to things revolving around Torah, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, the intent the intent's never wicked, but um, you can see where these things kind of take you whenever you start establishing added things in order to keep the law, right, which is what was going on, just adding things in order to make sure that Torah was not going to be violated, and then, you know, that leads you down a path of uh, pride, ego, you know, exaltation, hmm. you know, all, all things like that. So <clears throat> that's where it lands with us. But, yeah, we can definitely check that out, look at the start of it, and then see where the actual words derive from for their they're in the Old Testament as far as those words and where they got the term Pharisee and Sadducee from. So we can, yeah, we can break those down and um, yeah, dig into it. Because yeah. without the most high really guiding us on how to do it the right way, the enemy knows what he was doing when he asked us to pick him. Because mm -hmm. by itself, it feels like it's the boss of that situation, you know. I'm bold enough to lead the Shemaim. The earth is in my hands. I must be doing something, right? Right? But he doesn't come out in public and be like, hey, I'm going to walk among the people and claim y'all. And, you know, I'm trying to get y'all to be see there's another way to do righteousness. No, it's I'm going to hide the shadows and I'm going to do whatever I do. I'm going to talk to you in your mind, the secret chambers, but I'll never come out and sit down and break bread with you, pray with you, seek repentance, none of that. And that's the plague that human beings have right now is that we have to watch what spirits we're listening to because it will teach you how not to go before the Most High and seek to be redeemed. And you belong to him. We all belong to him. This paint, everything now he belongs to him. We just get the mm -hmm. gift of time right now to, you know, do something righteous with it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, well said. Well said. That's, that's definitely got to check spirits. That is, um, if something is leading you to uh, self-correct um, and not not self-correct in the sense of self-examination, and self-examination, the only way to do that is to go before the most high. But if somebody's telling you you can do it yourself, somebody's telling you, you know, you don't need to go before the most high or that's the vibe that they're giving out and stuff like that, yeah, those spirits you guys stay away from. But that's the whole point is to get you away from most high. That's why I mean, mm -hmm. self help books are like the worst thing ever because you can't help yourself. You don't know how to help yourself. <laughs> like you have That's no true. idea of what you need. You're reading somebody else's opinion on how you should help yourself. And it's like we really just break that down and think about it. That just, it doesn't make any sense at all. Only the one who created you would know how to truly help you um, because he knows exactly what what you need. He knows what's in you. But uh, to listen to somebody else tell you how to help yourself. Um, looking for another Torah, self-help books, looking for some other instructions. Yeah, that's what they are. Hmm. That's what they are. It's another another form of commandments, but according to uh, according to the flesh. So some things will work, but only for a matter of time because, you know, situations change, your life changes, and then those things don't work anymore because they're fleshly. You know what I'm saying? They're not, they're not spiritual, they're not eternal. So this is why the most high his law says the commandments, his guidance, the words that he speaks to us, that's why they're uh it's on another level. Because first off, you can read the same word a hundred times and get a new revelation from it every single time, according to the most high, as far as what you need to do. And then uh his commandments are time they're Thomas. You know what I'm saying? They fit for all people, all nations, no matter what. Is it, it literally is designed to create perfect harmony. It's designed to create shalom for those who follow. And so, uh, you know, anybody else, they're gonna they're gonna always put their opinion, their spice on it. And like I said, some things may work, uh, and it's not bad to receive instruction on things that um, we 
it's not bad to receive instruction on things that we need to be trained up to do. It's not bad to, you know, for somebody to teach you how to work out or somebody to teach you how to build something, things like that. Occupational things or, you know, athletic things, fitness, whatever, even health to a certain extent. But uh, everything has to be filtered through tour. And that's, that's the whole thing, even when it comes to health, because you yeah. got some, some health gurus out there who will tell you that, hey, work is fine, right? Yeah. Try to trip it off, it is fine. But you know what I want. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's all going to be filtered. So does that mean that there is a Torah of good and evil, but it's not a Torah? Kind of like what I guess the Jews under their own instruction tried to do with the so-called oral law and the oral traditions. Right. Yeah, the, I mean, Hassan definitely has a he definitely has a way of life, right? His way of life is death. I guess that would be what hyperbole, but yeah, his his way of life is eternal damnation, but it's definitely set in motion. This is why everything in the world it leads you down that path to destruction, or it leads you to covet, you know, uh, physical things, carnal things that um, are not going to last, right? That that cor- that are uh, corrupted. You know what I'm saying? That do they fade away, they get old, things like that. You know. So. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm glad you said exactly what I was thinking. It's a tour of corruption because everything that we apply his rules to falls apart. It's crumbling. Right. The fruits are going bad. It's fermenting. You know, it's out of control. It's spores. It's we see it out here. We're applying all praise to the Most High that His righteousness is still holding us all together. Because without no filter, this would be truly like the days of Noah. It might be getting that way, but I was definitely holding things in place, giving people time. But if it was really under that good and evil and you can do whatever you want to do, the knowledge of good and evil would be the knowledge of what's good for me, no matter what evil I have to do to get it. Um, Yeah, (laughs) that's what's happening. Witty inventions, wicked imaginations. Putting things out into the world, man, for profit, for gain, for what's good for them, but see the corruption that comes from it. See the evil the evil that comes from it. So it's happening. That's like a whole nother sacrificial system right there, because are you willing to sacrifice the innocent, the widows, the fatherless, for your gains? Oh yeah, the, the, the you of this world, they for sure are. They don't care. Matter of fact, those are the ones that they take advantage of. So uh hmm. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's always been the, that's always been the world's mentality. It is, you know, to get game by any by any means. Hmm. Does it profit the man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Yeah. Hey, man. <laughs> oh man. Where's that my shot, man? What does it cost? There's no cost. High cost. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. All right. Before we jump off, I'm going to show play a little snippet of this video that I found. It's kind of interesting. Uh, cool. Title, 100 Years. I know we got the uh, Coaches coming on next. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I sent you this video, but it's very interesting. Just a small snippet, though. In Psalm 74 9, we see not our signs, there is no more any prophet, neither is there among us any that knoweth how long. Even though nothing more was written in the Bible after the prophecy of Malachi and before the time of the birth of Jesus, the history of Jerusalem continued on. The Babylonian Empire controlled Jerusalem from about 607 BC until 539 BC. Then the Middle Persian Empire took control of Jerusalem a little before it gained into control of Babylon and controlled it for a little over 200 years, from 539 BC until 332 BC, when Alexander the Great went to Jerusalem. He became the king of Macedonia, a region of Greece, when his father Philip II was assassinated. The Macedonian Empire was strong enough and wealthy enough that it enabled Alexander to go on and defeat the Persians. 
Bible scholars have called the bronze or brass section of Nebuchadnezzar's great image the Grecian Empire of Alexander the Great. We have to wonder at this point, if this is not written in the Bible, why am I teaching anything about an empire that has nothing to do with the Bible? It has been said, to understand Bible prophecy, you have to know and understand history. You have to know the history of these regions in order to understand the prophecies in the book of Daniel. How did the Grecian Empire affect Jerusalem? Here is the story. The high priest in Jerusalem had reason to fear Alexander's coming to Jerusalem. But when Alexander besieged Tyre, he sent a letter asking the high priest to send reinforcements and supplies to help him defeat Darius. But the high priest refused as he had made an oath with Darius that he would not take up arms against him. This made Alexander angry, and he was determined to go against the high priest. Before Alexander headed for Jerusalem, the high priest had a dream from God that the priest and the people should go out to meet Alexander when they saw him coming, and that this would go well for them. When Alexander saw them coming to meet him, he went unaccompanied to the high priest. James Usher says, After Alexander had prostrated himself before that God whose name he saw engraved on the golden plate of the high priest mitre, he greeted him. The priest went before Alexander as he entered Jerusalem. Alexander went up to the temple and sacrificed to God in the manner which the priest showed him. I'm going to stop right there because I know the coach is about to come in. Now, in history, we've never heard this before. Mm -hmm. Have you heard it before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was prophesizing. I did research on this topic like a long time ago when I first came in this because I was really interested in uh, um, Daniel specifically and then um, Daniel, Joel, and then Revelations. Mm -hmm. I was really uh, interested in those books. It'll lead you down that whole rabbit hole as far as Alexander the Great, everything that he conquered, um, <clears throat> and how he came, how he came across the Israelites, and uh, you know wanted to wanted to learn from us. He wanted to learn about Elohim, like who it was, things like that. This is how we we actually came. I won't say he was the one. I can't remember. If he's the one who orchestrated it, but. This is how we get to the Septuagint and you know our book actually being translated by those uh those 70 uh we could say 70 elders um uh -huh. Hebrew and Greek. But yeah, that whole history is there. It's, and um Alexander the Great, man, he was yeah, he was running things. He was definitely the superpower at that time, for sure. Now one thing she said that is not in the Bible, but we know that at one point in time this was in the Bible. Mm -hmm. We're going to get to that, too, because as we talked about before, maybe last year, the Levitical priesthood, or rather described the system that describes the Sadducees and the Sadducees set up is what we have nowadays with this modern day religion system. Right. Well, they didn't know they were shooting themselves in the foot or all of us with all this spiritual confusion. Right. But that's where we'll stop it right there. Uh, all those that watch this. All praise to the Most High. We study your scriptures. Follow Hamashiach. And be prepared to meet Abba. Do the best you can. Do better. Study to show yourself approved. Any final yeah. thoughts? Uh, all good. Uh, good uh, <clears throat> the Most High.